Hello and welcome to our game with myself, Shane Stapleton and Michael Verney as ever with me. Yet another unbelievably busy weekend. Just before we start and talk into it, a reminder to everyone, could you please subscribe to the channel, bottom right hand corner if you're watching on YouTube and follow all the different social channels, would appreciate that very much. Also, if you want the audio podcast, patreon.com forward slash our game, just a fiver a month. Again, all about supporting the channel, so I'd appreciate it if you could do that there. You can get all the audio podcasts and there will be some exclusive content going in there. Michael, you were uh, you were around the grounds yourself this weekend. There's, I mean, there's so much to reflect on, and all not to mention the fact that we've got the likes of Oshin Mullen staying in the country. But the first place we're going to start is uh, Dublin Galway. You saw, I think you saw Galway was it last week against Offaly, so you saw Henry Shefflin's first game in charge. Uh, now I was at this game, so you'll turn the gun on me and ask me about it. But what, like even when you saw the scoreline, Dublin three twenty nine, Galway nineteen, you must have thought, is there a typo here? Yeah, uh, yes and yes and no. Dublin had a strong had a strong team out, uh, and Galway. When you saw Galway's team, yeah, there was a handful of regulars: uh, Anna Murphy and goals, Gerald McInerney at centre back, the two Mannions were on the bench. But like, I like I put it to you this way: Do you think the vultures are going to be out for Henry already? Oh, they're going to be hounding him out of Galway already. No, nah, not at all, not at all. But you can't ignore the the nature of it. Like, so a week ago, you know. People are enjoying asking me, what about Tipperary now? First game in charge, losing to Kerry 17 points to 14. And it's, you know, it's not the end of the world. It's definitely not. And I'm sure, like Henry Shefflin was fairly much saying it after the game, he's not going to get too carried away. He didn't have that many regular starters. I suppose the ones you look at were Dar uh, Darren Morrissey, who kind of established himself last year. Grode McInerney, everyone would have seen him. Niall Burke, who had a pretty quiet game. And Evan Nyland, who's kind of been in and out of the team and certainly been getting close to establishing himself in the last year or so he was in corner forward and by the way he scored a couple of points that were just over the shoulder out by the sideline own kelly himself would have been um proud off of the left off the left yeah as you can imagine it was men versus boys though i mean dublin definitely had a much stronger team and Owen o'donnell was one of the players that hadn't initially been named but he was named from the start uh, Chris Crummy, he was thrown in. He was in around this, uh, the the middle sector of the field and got upfield for his goal as well. You know, we, often we talk about would he score as much if he was in there wing back? And do you know, do you want that really strong half back line? But like he's such a threat, to go even going the other way because he's such a great athlete. You can kind of see why they're doing that. But if he can get ahead up of steam, he's very hard to stop. Yeah, and Donald Burke, he also started. You know, Matty Kenny was asked about Donald Burke after the game after scoring eighteen points. Where can this lad go? And he just goes, well, I'll just find the quote here. He said, um, his game is in a good place, but there's still room for him to prove to get to the top, top, top level. And he knows that. Matty's after going full Premier League, Jamie Redknapp, <laughs> top, top uh, there. But the way he strikes the ball and the way he's able to evade people and has that spatial awareness, like I definitely feel there's, there's a bit more we can get from him. He's been in and around the Dublin panel for four or five years, had one summer away. But um, I think we, we've both said it a good few times, this lad's ceiling is, is very, very high in terms of where he can go. Yeah, I think it's just developing that consistency, even from place balls. He can, he can, I think it was in the league last year where he was actually taken off uh, taken off freeze in one of the league games last year. It's Happened probably for Lapina as well, like yeah. against in the quarterfinal. So it's getting that consistency just that, like, I'm not being smart. Like, I don't see Aaron Galan being taken off freeze. Uh, Joe Canning, Barron, like a year when he came in late after being with Portumna and they put someone else in freeze. Like, he was never taken off freeze. Henry was never taken off freeze. It's just developing that consistency to know that every day you go out that this lad's going to nail probably. 95% up from freeze. Um, from place, from, uh, when the ball is in his hand in general play, he's generally got a pretty good conversion rate as well. I suppose the question mark would be, is maybe at times it's it's loose uh, or loose-ish and it's just making sure that, like, uh, you could probably make a, you know, a comparison with maybe someone like Patrick Horgan for a while who maybe you could say wasn't winning the, the tougher ball at times and now over the last five or six years, He's been winning balls even that he shouldn't be winning. Um, and that's kind of what you want from Donald Burke as well. And just developing that consistency that the really, real, you know, elite forwards have in the country. But as you say, he's only four or five years county experience. He was one year off, so it takes a while to catch back up. His age profile, uh, being in his early 20s, would definitely suggest that he hasn't hit or even reached anything close to his ceiling yet. And that's an exciting that's an exciting thing for all Dublin supporters to know that he can get an awful lot better if he continues to apply himself and, and stay doing what he's doing. 
Yeah, and uh, one thing I'd say about Matty Kenny's panel here is it's developing. We'd always probably have a little bit of a concern about, you know, when you dig into the into the bench, what are you going to get? And I had to say I was quite quite impressed with some of the guys that aren't necessarily regulars or may not even be in the summer. But, you know, the likes of John Bellew did well. Um, I think the likes of Ronan Smith came in. He did fine. Aidan Mellet showed a couple of flashes. He's very kind of sparky corner forward that um, I would have seen a bit with Bally Bowden over the years. Colin Curry, he came in, did pretty well. Fergal Whiteley took a step on in another direction. I thought he was very good. Ryan or Ryan McBride. I was actually, I even asked Sean Brennan, who played in goals for Dublin yesterday, is it Ryan or Ryan? And he says different people call him different things. So call him what you want. He doesn't seem to mind that much, but he was really good. Scored a goal, set up what I thought was another goal for um, for Colin Curry, but apparently it hit the side netting because I saw it stretched the net and I thought. Oh, obvious goal here. He's about eight yards out. He he obviously didn't miss that, but turns out it was disallowed and it was in the side netting. Now, Keen O'Sullivan was very good. Last year he was playing, and generally you'd see him playing on the inside line, but he was a bit further uh, out in this game and it sort of suited him because he has a bit of pace and he was able to run at the Galway defence. Now, all of this is, you know, you're looking at it through the, the prism of how poor Galway were. Like, of course, yeah. There was a row in the second half, and I and I tweeted at the time. This is the first time that Galway have ever have even put a hit in today. So for Dublin, there might be that element of a false sense of security, or maybe Dublin are starting to get the Indian sign over Galway a little bit. You know, we saw the the game in Leinster in the semi final last year. But what I said about Dublin last year, and I'll say again this year, they're starting to develop a team with more and more classy hurlers. Like he won't be talked about too much, I'd imagine, but Connor Burke. The way he uses the ball, and he's a lovely striker, and he's one of these players who can come out, shape as if he's about to strike it. he look up and see there's something else on, and he just tap it back into Hurley, stay going again. He's, he's good. Sean Moran came on, and he looks like a player with the bit between his teeth. You know, the last year or so hasn't really happened for him, but he looks like he has a hunger there. So if they can get him back to his best, there's another very quality hurler in the back, back line. Shane Barrett, as you mentioned last week, is back on the panel. If they can get him at 100% and get him absolutely fit and flying at the top of his game. That's another addition too. And I, I just think things are starting to look a little bit good. And Sean Brennan is looking, shaping up as if he's going to push Alan Nolan very strongly for the goalkeeper position. Look very solid. And just the way he came out showing for the ball off his defenders all the time, got on the ball so much. It's just starting to look pretty good for, for Dublin at the moment. Options would be the word when you go through all them names there. And mm. Loads of options in in every position. Loads of competition in every position. Um, the, the guy that's going to be replacing someone if someone is out injured or someone has to come off or they're fatigued I mean, or whatever. Ronan Hayes, by the way, who came on. There you go, and Trolley or Dylan, uh, Danny Sutcliffe, uh, Liam Rush. Like there are a lot of options there. Um, and I would have been skeptical. Remember, I just remember seeing Dublin against Clare in the league a couple of years ago, and just been, I was blown away by I thought what I looked at the lack of options that they had. Uh, and you know, a couple couple of years on, they seem to have a lot more options. And you're talking about men against boys there. You know, a lot of the Galway lads were coming up against seasoned inter county players. Like Owen O'Donnell, the best forward in the country, would struggle to get anything off Owen O'Donnell. So you know, a raw rookie forward is going to struggle even more. Chris Crummy is just a wrecking ball at, at that level. And if you're 19 or 20 and you're coming up against him anywhere out around the middle of the park. You're, you know, you're in serious pressure, just being bowled over by him. But the options is the big one for me, and it's, it's I think it's exciting. There's a bit, of, there's two team, teams I'm excited about, and we talked about the other later. Clare is definitely one team that I'd be excited about that they could, you know, potentially take a scalp this year and be real consistent. And Dublin is another team that are starting to excite me. Um, and to be honest, Dublin hurling has never really excited me for whatever reason. Just because I don't know, it's because they're in Leinster, we would have been in competition against them. Uh, but I think, yeah, I just think there's options there, and I, yeah, and I'd be, I'd be, you know, quietly confident about what they could do this year. There's obviously three places up for grabs in Leinster. Um, you've Cody against Shefflin, then you're probably going, to, you're talking about Wexford, Dublin, probably realistically for that third spot. So. Someone's got someone's going to miss out. I would I would always four, and I think it's it's a good bit away, but it's going to be seriously interesting. Yeah, the comments are flying in here already, and keep them coming in. As as we often say, we don't know everything. We know a little bit, but not everything. Connor David said, "Is it make or break for Matty this year?" I wouldn't think so. I mean, it is year four, but I don't think he necessarily. I mean, as long as they don't flop, I think there's like we're talking about it now. He's actually developing a squad, and I would have said. 
things were looking threadbare maybe a year and a half ago and now all of a sudden like there's so many different names maybe there's something here like the point that Gerardo Gracon is making if imagine if Dublin's hurlers weren't playing inter-county football you know Kieran Kilkenny, Cormac Costello so on and so forth any reason why Lee Gannon switched codes uh, I think he's a bit of a dual player like I, I would have thought he's a bit more football ahead of hurling but I remember playing a league game against Whitehall a couple of years ago I was full back. He was centre forward. Thank God he wasn't near me, like because he's just lightning pace and he'd scored six points, I think, in this league game. Uh, really, really good player. Patrick Hickey makes a good point here. What block uh, training, well, basically, what sort of block training are teams doing at this time of the year? It's hard to know. Um, would be worrying to be beat that bad for Henry. Yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm looking through the team here and I'm asking myself who really stood out. And Evan Nyland had those couple of flashes, and you know we talked about him a lot, so clearly we rate him. Kevin Cooney had a very tough day of it against Owen O'Donnell, and like you said, many, many established players have as well. Don't really blame him too much, and it's not like the ball going in was unbelievable. Don O'Shea, so Eamon O'Shea's son, he made his senior um, competitive day. Or did he play the week before against Offaly? He played against Offaly, yeah. Okay, so he played in this game here. Now, you know, he's a, he's a young player, he's very slight, so he's going to be needing a team that's actually competing well against Dublin to get him into the game. So it was a tough afternoon for him, but I think, you know, no one's going to make a judgment on the young lad. He clearly has quality. But what stood out to me is that even with Evan Nyland on the field, they put Donal O'Shea on the freeze and he hit him well. Two excellent free takers. But to me, when I looked at it, I thought this is probably Henry Shefflin trying to get this lad comfortable and established. Let him get his name on the score sheet. Yeah, so I I would have thought that's the reason. Would would you would you agree? Yeah, prob probably. Yeah, but he also said like a manager's take an opinion on something as well, and he, maybe even from afar. Me and you probably would have thought about Evan Island as the successor to 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 Joe Canning in terms of free taking. Someone else takes takes a completely different line on something or an opinion on something or they've seen something. And maybe they've seen a club game. Maybe Henry has seen a college game where he liked the look of Don O'Shea. Or it could be what you say there, or it could be just a matter of Evan Island has played a couple of years at county level. Does he need to be hit and freeze to get his confidence up? Probably not. Does Don O'Shea maybe to be eased into a game? You know, like they all, you always say, you know, a free taker wants like a couple of handy frees out around 45 in the middle, get their confidence up. Whereas if, you know, there's a tight one out around the 65 and you put it wide, then all of a sudden you get a ball in your hand from play and maybe that doesn't go over as well and it has a knock-on effect. So I think it uh, I think it makes sense, to be honest with you. I think it makes sense to do that. And he probably has a fair idea what he's going to get from Evan Nyland as a free taker anyway. But if I was... Henry, I'd be, I, I'd be honest with you, I'd be love, I'd be loving this. Uh, there was a big fanfare around the Offaly game and his inter county debut. They won, not playing particularly well, to be honest with you. I thought it was a game Offaly could have won, uh, and now they've got a bit of a hiding. They've, they've, uh, there's no Henry versus Cody in the Walsh Cup final. That's going to be saved for probably the championship, barring the meet in the league. Um, they've been taken down a couple of pegs. Not that he has a stick to beat them with, but he's like, lads, we were absolutely blown away the other day. Like, blown away. Like, this is what's ahead of us. This is a realistic. We played awfully and we were fine. It looked like we coped at that level. We absolutely got devoured yesterday. This is, you know, this is, we're here and we have to go to here. I think it's fairly obvious after yesterday. So I don't think he, I don't think he'll be, as he said himself, I don't think he'll be pushing the panic button far from it. And again, how many frontliners were playing realistically? A handful, especially in comparison to the dubs. Um, and you don't know, chatting to Cheddar Plunkett after Leach, the Leach game yesterday, Leach looked like they were in a winning position against Kilkenny and kind of faded for the last 20 minutes, partly down to Kilkenny, but partly down to what he said was like a real big like training load, a big block that they're doing in the three weeks before the league. So again, you don't exactly know what's going on behind the scenes as well. Like Galway could have done, you know, the mother and father of a session on Friday night. You just don't know. Yeah. Well, one thing I do know is that Dublin could have won this by a lot more. Like to win a game by 19 points and think, geez, we left four or five goals scoring opportunities <laughs> behind us isn't great. Uh, Tom Monaghan had a goal chance for, for Galway, but he put that over the bar. He came on, did okay. Cahill Mannion came on. He made a bit of an impact. I'd be expecting a little bit more out of the likes of Niall Burke. You know, he's the starting guy, the, the player that's well established in that forward line. You know, he got two points, but I want to see him out winning ball, dominating, maybe, you know, win a couple of puck outs. But... And he can, and he can win puck outs on, on yeah. a given day, he can. Yeah. Uh, John Maher says here, no need uh, for Galway to panic in the slightest yet. A lot of hurling ahead. Shefflin knows no trophies handed out in January. Great show, lads. And many thanks for all. No problem, John. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us today. But um, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, let me just say, like Parnell Park, it's it's not uncommon for for Dublin to to beat teams or even bully teams at times there, but it's a world away from Croke Park, so th- that's yet another reason for Galway not to panic. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, uh, Crow Park, the Crow Park's dimensions are totally different, and the whole feeling of playing in Crow Park is poles apart from from Parnell. But they, they can't blame Dublin. That's that's their home. They generally play really well there. They br- generally bring teams uh, into the trenches when they play up there as well. Suits them suits them perfectly. And when you have someone like Donald Burke who can score anywhere from a hundred yards in, uh, and he can end up with a tally like he did yesterday, was it eight from play? He ended up with like that's. That's what he can do, as particularly in a ground like that, where if he gets the ball, even at his own 65, and gets a chance to open his shoulders at all, he's, he's a fair chance of scoring. So definitely uh, a lot of positives from a Dublin point of view. Galway probably just taken back down to earth a small bit. Not saying that they were getting run away with themselves after last week. They probably weren't. But I think Henry is probably in no doubt. I wouldn't say he was in any doubt about where what they needed to do and the work they needed to do anyway. But if he was in any doubt, he definitely got his answers yesterday. Yeah, I was very inexperienced panel. But um, I think even the fact that the Thomas's lads are away, that's going to impact them too. With Shane Cooney being out for the year with an ACL, that's another blow. So Galway... Lots of work for, for Henry Shefflin to do. Now, you were down in, um, I think it was John Locke's Park, where you in Callan yesterday to see Kilkenny beat Leash 127-0-24. As far as I've heard, the first 30 players that Kilkenny have were training earlier that morning at about 11 o'clock. So what you saw was probably the third string Kilkenny team, which makes it, this quite impressive. Yeah, um, I think Kieran Wallace, uh, I think Kieran Wallace, Luke Scanlon, David Blanchfield, Chris Bulger would have been the only ones that would have started at say any games of any significance. I think Luke Luke Scanlon started against Galway in a championship game in Salt Hill a couple of years ago. Yeah. Bulger Bulger uh, is one of a handful of lads, maybe with Shane Walsh and a couple others who were on briefly on the panel, maybe off it and back on it again. Um, Chris Bulger was taken off a half time yesterday, which probably doesn't. Uh, doesn't bode well for his kind of future over the next couple of weeks, but it looked like uh, it looked like Leash were in control of this game. Uh, Evan Landy got a goal for Kilkenny in the 13th minute, kind of totally against the run of play. I think it was Liam O'Connell, the Leash centre back, was in possession of the ball and went back across the square and it was blocked down. I think by Shane Walsh. Landy scored it. They were level at the first water break. They didn't deserve to be level at all. Leash had hit uh, ten wides in total in the first half. Some pretty bad. But Leash were still ahead at the at the break by a point. I think it was what uh, thirteen to thirteen points to one nine, and they were still three ahead by the forty eight minute. I think, and they only scored five points thereafter. Kilkenny reeled off fourteen points. Now there was a bit of a breeze, but I wouldn't have thought it was you know that significant. Like Ender Olin was still scoring two frees from inside his own half, you know, with the bit of a breeze that was against them. So I wouldn't have said it was that significant. Again, I don't know the the training block that Leash were in, but Kilkenny. Definitely finished much the stronger. Um, and it was definitely a couple of names that stood up and staked the claim. We've probably talked about David Blanchfield before, uh, Liam's younger brother from the bridge. Uh, he was very good. And he, I, I remember seeing him two years ago and thinking this lad has a lot of the attributes and just thinking he probably needs to fill out. He's filled out a, go, a good bit. He's kind of, he'd be lanky enough, probably about six, three or four, but he looks an awful lot stronger now. Shane Murphy was the other wing, Owen's, uh, Owen's younger brother. He was good. He hit two from uh, two from distance. Colin Prenderville, wing forward, was very good. He hit three. And it's not, do you know, um, they weren't like real, they weren't real classy points. They were real dogged points where he was under pressure kind of, which to me is better again. He was on, he was on Ryan Milani, who'd be fair, you know, seasoned enough inter-county defender at this stage, and he took him took him for three points. Uh, Robbie Buckley, who I really liked in the county final for all Auckland's, he was the he was the fella that uh, he gave the hand pass for was it Owen O'Shea's goal in the first half. He's a real kind of workhorse. He came on at half time and was brilliant. Uh, wouldn't be probably renowned as a scorer, but ended up with three points. Worked really hard. Uh, his size might catch him out at county level because he's probably only about five nine. Maybe ish, but he's a real, real worker and a real kind of team player. They were probably the the players that stood out most. And like Gilkenny crowd weren't getting like angsty, but they were probably disappointed with what they saw for maybe forty or forty five minutes. But the last twenty or twenty five minutes was fairly resounding, and they ended up winning by six and could have won probably probably by nine or ten. Um, Leach kind of let them shoot from out the pitch, which I thought was they didn't. It's like they didn't want to have their full back line exposed in any way, so. 
not that they gave them the ball, but Kilkenny took a lot of shots on from longer distance out the pitch and hurt them from out the pitch. Yeah, I hear Conor Heary played well also, the, the old Auckland's man. But um, actually, now that you mentioned that about Leash allowing the opposition to... Well, is it was it a bit like Wexford in the Leinster Championship last year where they almost conceded the ball out the field and then the other team was able to beat them from distance? Yeah, Kilkenny went short. Um, I don't know if every second time. They went short a bit anyway. But with with the way... like Callan is... a big enough pitch but it's still not Crow Park and you can't allow halfbacks to be striking on the front foot or to plant their feet um, and David Blanchfield had a wide I think from distance and even had a couple of wides from distance but it's almost like they didn't want to be exposed at the back uh, or want real good ball going into the Kilkenny full forward line and Kilkenny were able to hurt them from out the pitch and it's gas just thinking like it's the new age half backs like David Blanchfield hit a point Connor here he got a point from centre back Shane Murphy got two points from wing back like there's no longer any idea of a stopper really playing wing back unless it's a you know a man marking job on a given day you're going to get a couple of balls in a game where you have chance to do big damage and if you can't strike the ball 90 to 100 yards accurately and over the bar you're probably not going to fit the bill for a modern day wing back and I believe um, Brian Cody was was only delighted to talk to you about the fact that it was his twenty fourth season in charge. Yeah, uh, it was quite funny. Like uh, Brian is Brian is uh, a very uh, unique character within the GA, and I'm sure anyone who's seen any of his interviews, he he doesn't give, he doesn't tend to give too much away. But as a journalist, you kind of would have lots of ideas in your head about like what you're going to ask him and this and that. And he's the best man I've ever seen to nip nip a conversation in the bud. Like if he doesn't want to talk about it, but I just said to him like, you know, it's your 24th season in charge. Can, like is that hard to believe or whatever and he just said I'm not sure about the mathematics there I haven't checked it out but it's the start of this year and that's all I know like it's just such a, a Brian Cody thing to say like he's his 24th season in charge he is now you know the longest serving inter-county manager in any code consecutive years with the same county over uh, overtaking Sean Boylan who was 23 seasons like it's it's fair going and Again, as Patrick Hickey said on Twitter, he just said, like, the past doesn't really, is not relevant to him at all. Like, it's literally just about this game, Kilkenny today or Kilkenny next week. Like, nothing else matters, nothing that came before. But yeah, I, I, uh, I got served by Brian Cody yesterday. Yeah, it was a long interview overall, wasn't it? Yeah, um, yeah, it's not definitely definitely one of the shorter ones I have in my, in my voice memos on the iPhone anyway. I, I wouldn't say... Uh, it got to about a minute and 10 seconds, I'd say, yeah. But listen, it was a, a pre-season kind of championship match. I think he was quite happy with what he saw. He probably wouldn't have been happy um, at different stages with what he saw. But in the second half, which just a real good performance, he just said, you could say nearly all those players haven't played for Kenny, so they did themselves a lot of good. In the first half, Leash had a lot of wides earlier on, early on and could have built up a lead, but our lads came back into it, and I'm very, very happy with them. The competition for places is good. Lads are working hard to try and get in there and look at all of those players out there today showed that they have potential to play. So there's definitely a few lads put their hands up. But again, you have to be realistic and say, like, they're, they're, you know, the A squad, shall we say, was training yesterday morning. How many of those lads are going to get a chance throughout the league? Probably only a handful, maybe. But I would definitely say probably uh, David Blanchfield, Shane Murphy, probably to a lesser extent in defence, Conor Heary, but he was playing centre-back, so the demands are a bit more. Uh, Colin Prenderville, and probably Robbie, Robbie Buckley were the ones that, that really stood out. A minute Cody took to account for the off day that even Marty lasted longer than that. Obviously a reference to the 2008 All-Ireland Final, or was it 2009 one? 2009 after the, yeah. the Richie Power penalty, yeah. Yeah, a little bit salty after that. Uh, James Coughlin adds, great to have Intercounty hurling back. Great time of the year to see the younger lads coming through, getting games. That's all you can say at this time of year. The, was there any player that you could see in the summertime being a Kilkenny player? Is there anyone in the Leash team that kind of came out of the woodwork that we wouldn't have seen before? Difficult. It's kind of difficult to tell. Um, as I said, say someone like like Prenderville, I like the fact that just he was like kind of dogging it out, really. Like, and it was there weren't real glamorous points. There weren't real individual scores. There were just tough, hard earned scores. So that would have been that would have been one. Um, I said I really like Robbie Buckley's kind of just work ethic, and every forward line needs one of those guys that can probably do a lot of the donkey work for others. So he was there. I thought he was very good when he came in. Hit three points from play. Um, interesting from a leash point of view. Um, you know, Cheddar was asked after. You know, he said he said it's not going to be easy in in one B where they're coming up against Tip Waterford, Kilkenny, 
Dublin and Antrim. And it just, you know, when you read quotes and you might not think too much of them, but just when you hear them, he was quite defiant, I think. I, I think he's, like, Leeds were poor for long stages last year. There's no point in saying any difference. You know, they were beaten in all their league games. They were hammered by Wexford. And then all of a sudden their season turned around, a real good performance against Waterford, and then they beat West they beat Antrim and then they beat Westmead. And and the latter end of last season is what they want for this year, and they want to be competitive. And he just said he was asked, like, um, I just said to him, Do you want you I presume you want to take a good shot at some of the bigger names? And he just said, I wouldn't be here if I wasn't, to be honest. If I can't have a positive outlook for this team based on what I'm seeing in training and what's in the dressing room and the character of these players, well then I shouldn't be here. So yes, I am, and I'm really looking forward to that. I think this team from within itself it's not just me will drive it as hard as they can if there's other issues that we're not making results or something like that it won't be uh it won't be for the want of effort or level of preparation and heart and spirit within the team i think when we have them and if we keep our patience and driving hard at that we'll get to be or uh, we'll get to where we want to get to so i just thought he was you know and it's, it's just good like because that passion comes across from him to the squad as well at the end of the day like they're not there you know just to just to phone in championship or league games I presume they're mad keen to uh, mad keen to progress and Gavin O'Matney's on board now as a coach as well which I thought was interesting um, he, I think he'd be doing a bit um, in the preparations to kill Malik's game so they have Gavin O'Matney now and Franny Ford who's obviously not Ireland winning coach with Galway uh, I, I don't know much about uh Gavin, if whether he's done much coaching, but I would assume he's probably done bits with Kilmallock and underage teams. If anybody knows, he might be in, have been with a couple of club teams or even college or third level teams. But uh, definitely, he's been around an inter county squad for the guts of a decade and been around a fairly elite uh, club squad as well. So it'll be interesting to see what he brings to the table, too. Yeah, Joe Walsh asked, How did Shane Walsh perform? I think he scored one, too. I believe he was quite busy up front. Uh, no, he was he was on the freeze. He had nine, I think, seven seven oh. place balls. Uh, was decent enough. I scored a couple of good points and set up a few. There were probably a couple of others maybe that shone a bit more in attack. It'd be again, it'd be interesting. He was probably on the squad before. Might have played a few minutes in league. Be interesting. It's going to be interesting to see what lads are what lads are kind of held on to over the next while because they have a lot of uh, front line players to come back. I think yeah, as I said, I think Kieran Wallace. Luke Scanlon and Blanchfield were the only three, really, and Chris Bulger that have played any sort of meaningful game time before this. Yeah, Landy scored one too. I had that right. Yeah. Uh, do you think that Kilkenny is enough workhorse forwards and maybe lack a bit of silk or class up top? Well, I'd say there's plenty of class when you throw back in the Shamrocks ads like Owen Cody and Adrian Mullen. I don't think they'd be that far off in terms of class. No, I don't think so, yeah. Um, he, I think he's implying there that Kilkenny have all workhorses and not enough... Uh, Classy, classy forwards. Um, I think, I think they're get like Owen Cody. Owen Cody could develop into a really classy intercounty forward, and yeah. Adrian Mull, Adrian Mullen too, with a clean bill of health. Um, and they're gonna have to because TJ is probably gonna exit stage left over the next couple of years. So lads are gonna have to step up. But I think you always need. Um, even you know workhorses to come in at different stages in the game. Like it's just you know create a turnover, create a block, you know, create some sort of uh, uh, momentum in, in your play. And I think there's a couple of players that potentially could do that. And listen, are you going to see a Joe Canning style, real classy forward standing up in January? You're not really. So you learned, you learned a bit. It's more about learning about the characters of lads really at this time of the year. Yeah, absolutely. Now you, um, you're awfully, you're awfully team beat Antrim 318 to 21. And after losing by a couple of goals to Galway last week, Consistency seems to be the sort of thing that you're looking for, even even at this time of the year, because different players are going to be tried and what have you. So from your point of view, it's probably nice to see a victory, even if it doesn't mean a whole pile. Yeah, no, no, I think it is, yeah, to be fair. They're going into a Division One campaign um, and then they're going to have to be consistent because they're going to be up against it. There's no point in saying any different. So at least if you have consistency and you're you're not conceding too much, they scored 318 last or this week. They scored 19 the week before. Uh, no goal conceded this week, which was good. Um, just an awful lot more level. There's no kind of peaks and troughs. Uh, I'm hoping anyway, and there won't be over the next while that you just want to see that there's no like you know six or seven goals conceded like there were previous years. And you've said it regularly about sending sending offs. Thankfully, that's something that seems to have disappeared as well. Uh, touch wood, and there seems to be an awful lot more discipline. Um, and there was a cook. There's a couple of kind of new names that have that have done really well in a couple of games. Connor Malloy from Kulderi, uh, anywhere in the half back line around the midfield, he's been very good. He would have had 
you know, bad injuries over recent years. He looks like a big addition. Jack Screeny, a cornerback yesterday, very, very tight, solid defender, a uh, bit of dirt in him as well in, in, a, in a good way, which you can never have enough of that at county level because it's a real cutthroat kind of world in there and that full back line. He was good too. Um, Stephen Corcoran, who was sub goalie last year, he was good in the goals yesterday, saved a penalty. I think he saved penalties in consecutive weeks now. Um, he saved another one yesterday and even when Antrim were coming back into the game made a couple of big saves in the, in the second half it's funny the scoreline probably maybe looks like Offaly played better than they did um, they were well up at half time the three goals in the first half um, and they you know, weren't hectic in the second half but still kind of held on and got a good result. Neil McManus came on for Antrim and was brilliant in the second half. He had four from play, including one outrageous point over, over his shoulder, a savage point. So he's still going as well as ever. But uh, from an awfully point of view, just glad to see a bit of consistency and just see that it's going to be tough in Division 1A. And at least, you know, you're bringing a bit of confidence in here. Will many of the newcomers that started yesterday play in the league? You know, probably not. But you can't have Ben Keneally and Owen Cattle every day. So you're going to have to create blood new players. And I was saying about, like, can you blood? You cannot blood too many players in Division 1A. How can't you? Like, you can't. You just can't. So these are the games where lads are going to get their chance probably to be on an extended panel or be on a match day squad. These are the games where they where they get their chance. So um, they have a three-week build-up now into the league. They, uh, they finish mid-table in their group. So... Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how, how they go, but the consistency is the thing, and I think we're getting there slowly. Yeah, and there's, there's probably not that many Offaly players that are, you know, like the way you're saying there, Ben Keneally, etc., isn't going to be there every day. Like, those lads aren't used to play in Division 1A. I remember Ben Keneally playing very well in, was it the 2017 um, Leinster Championship, when, you know, when Offaly were still there. And that was a group game, so or maybe it was 2018 then. But there's probably not that many players there that are used to Division 1A or you know, the top tier, I know it's 1A and 1B. Yeah, no, very few. Uh, ben was corner back then. I remember marking um, Connor Whelan and he did well on him in Tullamore. Like Owen Cattle, the last time he played 1A, he was in goals. You know, mm-hmm. so it's, it is going to be, it's a big departure. Don't think Kieran Burke played. Don't think Ross Ravenhill played. Brian Dignan didn't play. Um, Liam Langton would have played a small bit. But there's, it's going to be... Um, it's going to be a big baptism of fire for a lot of them. But again, just having that consistency behind them is, is very, very important. Yeah, good win for Westmead over uh, Mead, their neighbours, Mead, 121 to 116. That was in the Kyo Cup. Jack Gillen, he scored 1-6, five of those frees. Kieran Doyle scored five and Niall O'Brien scored three. Mickey Burke playing centre back for Mead and knocked over two points from play. So fair to hi- fair play to him. Have to give him a bit of appreciation. Like he's had some innings between hurling and football, all oh. told. And just to stay doing it, no more than uh, no more than Keith Higgins, you know, still doing it for the Mayo hurlers uh, last year after finishing on football. Like it is fair going. Like and that's just a fella that just absolutely loves it. Obviously, and like he'll have to be carried out before before he finishes with Mead. He just obviously loves it. And anytime they're playing any any of the big teams, they're playing Carlo. He's picking picking up Mouse Kavanagh. If they're playing Offaly, he's picking up Owen Cattle. Like he nearly always picks up the opposition's best player. And that's the, the regard he's held in as well in Mead. Yeah, I've interviewed him a few times. I'm sure you have too. And his appetite for it is uh, unquenchable, I think, at this stage. Uh, Mikey K, you wonder, is the gap between Limerick and the rest getting bigger, operating at a different level now, on and off the pitch, Man City style? Martin Furlong, we'll come to Wexford and Tip in a while, played out a good challenge match yesterday. Egan trying out a lot of new talent in his first few games something which Davey failed to do in his last few years. Lads, just a quick word shown by the Antrim players uh, for the girl who was killed in Tullamore, uh, showing great respect. Obviously, we'll pass on our condolences to the family there. Just Uh, on that, Shane, there was a lovely gesture before the game where the Offaly and Antrim players made the letter A in O'Connor Park. It's just a a lovely gesture, especially considering, you know, the geography of of where the game was played and where the where the horrible incident happened as well. So, yeah, and even just with, um, was it Roscommon the other night? Not, not using the number 23, which was Ashling's age and things like that. I think the GA community um, always shines bright in good or bad, but particularly in bad times. It, it yeah. really is a beacon of the, you know, the community, really, particularly in bad times. Absolutely. Um, do you know what? Probably the credit that Tom Mullally deserves hasn't been given to him. What he did over the weekend was incredible. Winning a Leinster Intermediate title with Nace and then coming back and beating Kildare with his Carlo team all on the one afternoon. Like He's an underrated, very, very good um, manager, obviously. And I was going to say, well, it's not. It's obviously at both levels now because he's doing pretty well with Carlo. 
Yeah, uh, any teams Tom has been with, sure, he was with wasn't he with Mount Leinster Rangers, wasn't he with Clara and Kilkenny as well, yeah. just is able to get a team to a level, a really, really consistent level, generally just gets the best out of the teams that he's with. So, you know, at one o'clock, at one o'clock yesterday, he was in Newbridge uh, as Nace beat I'll get Glen Bryan 312 to 111. Fairly comprehensive, now to be fair. And they kept Seamus Casey to just five place balls like that would have been the dream scenario that he wouldn't go to town kept Podge Doran quite enough he got a goal and on the other side like Jack Sheridan was brilliant he had 2-3 one point from a free 2-2 two, two from play the both goals in the first half Brian Byrne who had had disappointment with the Nace footballers well, he's obviously the Kildare Hurling captain, so Hurling is probably his, his primary game. He was brilliant as well. He had five, uh, three frees, and then Cottle Dowling hit one, two as well. Just a, a great win. And then, like I saw the interview after, it was with one of the Nace selectors. M Maxi was his first name. Anyway, that just Kildare J had Nace selector Maxi because uh, Tom Mullally was gone well down the road and was on his way to Carlo at that stage. So um, I'm actually chatting him later on today. So I just, I'd be interested to see the whole you know, logistics of it all, exactly what way it played out. But he was down in Carlo before throwing and saw his Carlo side uh, beat Kildare after leading the Kildare team to Leinster glory. They then beat Kildare 125 to 19. Uh, Mouse Kavanagh came off the bench and hit eight points, I think three from play. And Niall Boulder also came on and hit four. They were both brought on a half time. I think there was seven half time substitutes, which is a disaster for journalists uh, everywhere trying to keep up with what's going on. But um, I'm sure Tom, well, by the time the game was over, I don't even know if he would have got to, if he would have got to a pub to have a pint to toast it all, just about in time, I'd say. But uh, a mad afternoon, and I'm sure one he won't forget anytime soon. Yeah, I'm just looking over the, the, the throw in times of the game. So the Nace Oilgate game was at one o'clock, and was it four o'clock then for yeah. the other one? I mean, what, what time would his day have started there if he's driving up to Newbridge for the first game? And then by the time he gets home from the the Kyo Cup game, the man must have been absolutely bushed by the end of the day. No, he was that. I'd say he was down in Carlo first to have all the cones out in the pitch to save him ten minutes when he when he had to make the spin back down. Um, but yeah, I'd say a mad afternoon and organising the logistics of two different teams, particularly with Nace and all the fanfare around that because it's such a big deal. And the Leinster um, or the All Ireland Intermediate um, race is really are really interesting now. So you've got Nace from Kildare. You know, not a hurling stronghold. Kilmoyley from Kerry, also, you know, a so called kind of weaker county. And you have Turin thrown into the mix as well from Mayo. And I'm not too sure who won the Ulster. Um, but that's so so interesting. Like, you know, three out of four definitely would be, you know, unheralded names at all Ireland club level. Yeah. Uh, comment in here from John O'Sullivan. Did you did you watch the tip under 21 final, Shane? I didn't actually get to see it, but I know my Karki won and they look like they might be a bit of a common team with some of their underage success. Massive crowd at that, was there? Was that mm, the game that's... in Golden, was it? I think it was. Yeah, I just have to, to catch up on that one, I have to say. Um, Mul uh, Mul Th Tom Mullally, I presume, is what Martin Furlong's saying here. Coach my club, Horswood, from a relegation final in 2010 to a junior Leinster semi-final the following year. An unbelievable coach. Uh, Connor Heaney, uh, good to see you're not overreacting to one game, lad. Uh, Banner from Derry. Sorry, that's who it was. I remember yeah, we like, previewed a couple of their games. There's four uh, like teams that you wouldn't have... You would have done well predict that now before beforehand. Yeah, and it's great spread of counties out there. Like it's uh, it's teams. ideal. Like that's like I, I think it's great. The All Ireland um the All Ireland Senior Club Hurling is the four the four best teams in the country, really. And then the All Ireland Intermediate is four really novel teams. Like no Antrim team from Ulster. So you've got uh, Derry, Mayo, Kerry, and Kildare. Like that hopefully that is a sign of where Hurling is going to be in, you know, five to ten years and a good sign for those counties. And how long more Na will NACE be operating at intermediate level in Leinster? Not long more, I'd say. Um, and if Kilmoyley continue the way they are, maybe they won't be operating at that in in uh, in Munster as well, even though Ulster Club, Ulster or Munster Club hurling is a very cutthroat environment. That's the only yeah, thing. There's the problem. Like if you look at the, the scoreline that Bally Gunner put up against Bally A, and I know Bally A, you know, there's more in them and Tony Kelly wasn't playing, but that was a beatdown and could have been by far more. And, you know, uh, you're talking about Kerry's top team, their senior team, playing against maybe the third tier Tipperary team and beating them by, I think it was maybe seven or eight points, something like that. That team, if they went up straight into senior, I think it was mine, they'd probably get 
absolutely hammered at the top tier of Tipperary, just as the way things are mm. at the moment. So I'd, I'd be fearful for Kilmoyley if they went straight in at the top tier. Like most teams in Leinster Senior would get battered by Ballyhale the way they're going at the moment. So this is the thing for an ace. It's, you have to be very careful about this decision. But if the appetite is there, I, I would be saying 100% go and do it. And I'd imagine a lot of people in the club are thinking that. I know at Camogie level, I know that Galtier would have had to win back-to-back intermediates to get up senior, which might not necessarily be a bad thing. They've definitely earned it and they've proved themselves that they're, like, they have, there's nowhere else for them to go. They have to go up senior. Mm. And if, if uh, Clan Morris had won back-to-back junior finals, they would have went up intermediate as well. So maybe that's the maybe that's kind of the best way around it that you have to maybe back up a success that Kilmiley would have to win potentially win Munster again next year uh, to deserve a place shall we say at the senior table in 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 Munster but maybe I think it's I'd say it would probably be their decision I could be wrong but I'd say it would be their decision of whether they want to play at that level or not yeah John O'Sullivan talked about that my Karki team the other twenty one side they, uh, that group haven't lost a game or I presume title since they were under twelve. I know that that stat was put out before, and Brian and Mark Corcoran agrees. Some yokes. Which you is, love that one. You're always yeah. at that one. Some yokes, man. Uh, the monster hurling. Um, we know we're going to have a final between Limerick and Clare coming up soon, but the manner in which Limerick beat uh, Kerry was very comprehensive. Four twenty nine to eleven points, and after Kerry had done so well to beat Tipperary seventeen points to fourteen the week before, there probably was an element of hope that they could put up a decent show in here, but like 4.29 to 11 points is a serious beatdown when you consider that Barry Nash is the only survivor from the All-Ireland final victory over Cork five months ago. So what does this say about Limerick's depth? Yeah, uh, did this result take you aback a bit? It definitely took me aback a bit. I wasn't expecting, like, I thought it would be, I thought Limerick's inexperience, shall we say, for lack of another word, would have leveled the playing field a bit here. Like this, it's a fair scutcheon now. It's what thirty points all told, and then you have to think about like what does what does this say about Tipperary? Maybe the first day out, you know, if if they've been beaten by Kerry, only scoring was it three from play all all together, I think, or something like that, and then Kerry go out the next day with pretty much the same team, and Limerick absolutely destroyed them, an inexperienced Limerick team. So listen, I don't know if you're drawing farm lines there, you're saying that Limerick would beat Tipperary by. You know, for thirty something points, that's not the way hurling works. But um, I don't know. The result probably definitely doesn't paint Tip in a great light either. No, it doesn't. Every game is different, but I do think you have to 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 look at this Limerick team and say, if you're going that deep into the panel and you're winning a game by that much, wow, that does really kind of make you think that Colin Bonner has an awful lot of work to do to get his team up to the next level. Like I I saw one of our commenters already say, Colin Coughlin, he was in beast mode. He scored a couple of points there from wing back. Um, Adam English, a common player that we've talked about a few times, he came on at half time for Oshin O'Reilly and scored 1 1. Pat Ryan, very established player, senior player, he scored 2 3. He was named a full forward. Cahill O'Neill put in um, four, uh, four points. And David Reedy scoring 1 14, 10 of those from placed balls. Connor Boyle, is, like Paddy O'Loughlin being back on the county panel too, that's an interesting one because he had obviously opted out last year. He only came back late for Kilmallock in the Munster Club Championship there. William O'Donoghue came in. and um, But it's it's such a changed team. The, like, is this down to the fact that the culture that John Kiley has put in there and the, the belief and, I don't know, maybe even training sessions that all these players have such experience in, in like, unbelievably tough training matches that they're actually, they easily slot back into, they slot into a position. If they're promoted to the first team, they just slot in. Whereas, I don't know, with other counties, I know Colin Bonner is just picking up the team now and there's an element of transition and change and bringing some players back in that haven't been seen in a while. So he's kind of starting from scratch. So is that does that partly explain the difference? Well, like I, I tell, I'll put it to you this way. like We said that Cork had a better squad uh, and a better substitute list than Limerick going into the All-Ireland final. So I don't necessarily think that's true. Like I, I and I'm not going to base that on, on one result yesterday. Like, d- like, do me or you uh, think that the Limerick team will change much this year? Do we think that there's going to be a load of new faces? I personally don't. Um, and I think they have a good squad. I don't. I probably still don't think their list of substitutes is as strong as it was in 2018, when I think it was absolutely off the charts. Um, and it's generally been the same names that have come in 
done well, you know, some days, being maybe quiet other days. So I think there's um I think there's probably a couple of factors here. Like this had to have been a bit of a Kerry No show, or maybe, you know, they ran away with themselves a small bit after after last week's kind of historic win. But like like they mustn't have, they mustn't have, I didn't hear too much about the game, but they mustn't have performed anywhere near to the levels they got to the week before. Or anything near to what they're what they're capable of, because you know this is a second string Limerick team, and you can say that lads are playing for places, and yeah, they are, you know, to an extent. But like, no, there's no frontliners playing here. Like, this is a, a real second string Limerick team. So I think there's a couple of a couple of factors in here, and Kerry's underperformance has to be a, a, one of the major ones. Yeah, Niall Fogarty says Kerry played three games in seven days. In fairness, midweek game against Mary Ice, so they they would have been pretty stretched. Um, James Coughlin adds, as a Limerick man, I was impressed by the young lads, especially Coughlin, Cahill O'Neill and Adam English. They have physically become huge. We must be feeding them calf nuts over the winter. <laughs> that is the thing. Like, they are absolutely massive. And if you're physically outmatched, which, you know, I'm guessing that some of the Kerry players were physically outmatched in this game. It's very hard to keep into a team for 60, 70 minutes. If you're and outmatched physically, Shane, you are chasing your tail from the off. You're literally it's survival mode. It really is. You're just trying to spoil your man and you're trying to just stop him from getting the ball. We've probably all had it happen at different stages. And like if you're if you're physically outmatched in one position, you can overcome that. But if you're physically outmatched in a load of positions, as teams at the Lee McCarthy level are often finding against Limerick, I mean, what chance to do a team like Kerry who are still trying to build and kick on and Steve Malumfi will probably feel he has a lot of work to do yet. Like there, there's a fair distance to be made up. And, you know, a few more people are saying, you know, about the third game in a week. That's fair enough, Mark. We, we, we do accept that point. Uh, James S. Limerick have some panel. Scary. James Daly adds in, um, I'm still wrecked after the 49ers game last night, Shane. I was at uh, the game versus Kerry yesterday. It was over after 10 minutes. Some of our lads yesterday might not even make the panel for championship. That's there you go. true. That is true, because some of those names, I was like, God, I, I'm not overly familiar with this name and that name. So there was an element to that. So the power of that panel is unbelievable. Uh, Adrian McGrath, I suppose you'll want my car key in the top 10 clubs in Ireland next year. <laughs> sure, they're unbeaten since under 12. Uh, yeah. What more well, do you want? Nicely played, Adrian. We'll give you that one. Uh, Gerardo Grack on. Uh, sounds like you guys are ready to cancel the league and championship and engrave Limerick three in a row in the middle of January. It'll be interesting if they can keep the levels in Munster round robin. I don't think that's true at all. I think I, I think we've actually downplayed Limerick a bit here. And I think this is the key part of this is like if you're Kerry and you were running away with yourself a week ago, like this is why you just have to keep perspective the whole time, especially at this time of the year. You could be you could win, you know, beat Tipperary for the first time in, in senior hurling and then get annihilated by thirty points a week later. You have to kind of is a balance in between like are Limerick as good as we saw yesterday against Kerry. They're not. Not that Limerick team that went out. Are Kerry as bad as they were against Limerick yesterday? No, they're not. They're a lot better than that as well. Uh, Richie English was a man in a minute. Uh, mission. Colin Coughlin, excellent. Colin O'Neill got some great scores. Uh, living in Dreamland at the moment, what we have in terms of competitions for places, says James Daly. Uh, what did Vernie think of Michael Dignan's comments about the Limerick club players on the Kerry panel? Why is he commenting on that? I'm sure he was asked about that, and he did talk about uh, it maybe being a short-term view. So uh, Stephen Malumphy was asked about it and he says, any man with Kerry blood in his veins or who plays with a Kerry club, as long as he's willing to fight and die for the brother beside him on the team, he's welcome on this team. So three Limerick natives are playing, Paddy Ahern of Khalidi and the Munger duo of Louis D and Niall Mulcahy. I mean, look, I, I'm on Stephen Malumphy's side on this one. I have no problem with this at all, I have to say. I played as a permission player before with Wicklow, so I have no issue with this at all. And I would have like Wicklow ties. And you're not just going to go to a county for the sake of it unless you're living there or you switch clubs or whatever. I don't have an issue with it, I have to say. I don't have an issue whatsoever. If it increases competition within the Kerry ranks, gets them a couple of more hurlers, and the lads that they have uh, that have come in are totally bought in hook, line and sinker on Kerry Hurland. I have no issue with it whatsoever. It's three three more players that Steve Malofi can go to war with um, who are going to give him everything for the Kerry cause. So I don't have any problem with it whatsoever, I have to say. Um, John Kiley was talking about COVID and training numbers and, and that, and he goes, it was a slow start, no doubt. We'd 11 the first night, so we're building it up. The Kilmallock lads needed to get a bit of a break. Those that were involved with us last year have had no break, the likes of Graham Mulcahy, 
Uh, Barry and Robbie, they're on a break for a couple of weeks just to freshen things again. Other than that, Fitzgibbon is on, so we're releasing all the lads for challenge matches with UL and UCC and Keen Lynch with NUIG. There's a bit of balancing act going on, but we never really get upset over numbers. If we have 12, we'll train with 12, and if we have 22, we'll train with 22. We'll cut our cloth according to our measure, but we'll always get a session in and work hard. We'll be patient. It's important that we make the right decisions, and for me at the moment, that decision is that the lads playing Fitzgibbon get a chance to fight for their place with their team. Uh, whichever college they're in, and the lads from Kilmallock that were with us last year, they needed a bit of a break to freshen uh, up the, those. So those are the right decisions as regards the players and the numbers come second, which um, I'd have to agree with. Like if a manager can afford, I mean, obviously he has an absolutely massive panel. So it's a, if he still has enough players to put out in a match and obviously they performed well, maybe he would have preferred to put a few more frontliners in, in for this game. But the upside is with the amount of players that he has, playing college, uh, playing with county at the moment, and even club up until a little while ago. John kiley has got a huge depth of players all getting frontline experience at the moment. I mean, that is important. Like, if, if you're one of the... Let, let's say he had everyone in in his panel at the moment. Obviously, with the COVID thing is slightly different. You'd love to have all of those available. But if you've got... Um, let's say you've got 40 players and even an extended panel, we'll say maybe even 50 guys that are on your radar, and you've got 50... You know five or six of them that are getting club games you've got another 10 or 12 lads that are getting maybe even 15 lads that are getting games with fitzgibbon and then you've got lads in-house as well you've got so many players that are actually getting exposure to top level action there's a positive in there if you want to find it 100 percent, and like it's like this um decisions could be made on players based on you know how they're playing in a fitzgibbon cup match you know what I mean? And that's just the way it is. I think it's it's great. Kylie can only look at a certain amount of players. Like, you know, 15 take the field and he's going to bring on seven or eight subs and he'll learn about those 23 or 24 on a given day. But if he's seeing, like, not that he needs to know any more about Keane Lynch, but if Keane Lynch was a fringe player and he's up playing with NUIG in a Fitzgibbon Cup match, I don't know if Kylie can go because he's a principal in a school, but someone's going to go and watch it, and someone's going to give him a brief and say, you know, I saw, you know, I saw something in this lad that, that, that I think we could he could work as a whatever sort of an option somewhere, and then there's four lads playing with UL, and you know, two could go well, or someone could be playing in a different position than maybe that they're looking at, and maybe it'll open their eyes to something different because another manager has seen something else in them. So, play, I think, like playing competitive action. Um, be it club, uh, be it third level, or be it county, I think there's an awful lot to be picked up. So, yeah, I, th I think he's right to be encouraging the Fitzgibbon. I think he's right to be giving them the time for that. Like, you know, what's the time frame where they're going to be with their college solely? What are we looking at? Like, three and a half weeks, probably? And it, fair enough, it's it's a, it's the lead into the league. So, you could say maybe it's not ideal, but I think you have to look at the bigger picture of the development of these players. And some players that absolutely flourish at, at Fitzgibbon level. Maybe he hasn't seen that much of, of somebody um, amongst his squad, maybe just on the extended squad. Then he sees them in a Fitzgibbon Cup match and, you know, they excel. So, I think it's... I think it's uh, great benefit to a squad to to have that sort of attitude where you know you all don't have to be at training this night we'll see whenever we'll see whenever that's finished and we'll keep an eye on you if it's given yeah and then the player isn't sort of feeling torn between even just psychologically i'm torn between i need to try and make this training session and also that training session he can give the full of himself to that college team and sometimes you're playing in like uh hothouse atmospheres too and that can prepare you for maybe the league game which is the next step which We'll probably prepare you a little bit more than I know a challenge match or whatever. And with, with the county, we'll come to that in a second. Just a quick one, Shane. I remember playing Ooh. Fitzgibbon down in LIT during LIT Rag Week. We played LIT and uh, we had to win to get through, and they had to win to get through. And literally, it is like Galatasaray, like that's what it's like. The, there's um, you know, rope all around. Welcome to hell. This, yeah, <laughs> I remember hitting a sideline. And it was just like LIT, like who put you on sidelines? Yeah, I no, I can hit sidelines. To be fair, I can hit sidelines. Yeah, we'll no, have I to can, do yeah. copycats or a competition of, of sidelines. I'm terrible at them. Absolutely no issue whatsoever. It's one thing I practice a good bit on. But I remember, like, there was just a load of yahoos like shouting and roaring and bawling at you. And like, if that gets in your head and you let you let it get to you, you know, you, you dribble a sideline and maybe they get a score out of it. But as you say, it is a hot hot house atmosphere that. It's not going to prepare you necessarily for the heat of a Munster Championship final or something like that. But, you know, it will help you. It will help your development, I think. So I think um, I think Kylie's right to take everything he can from third-level competitions in particular. And look back at that 
I'd encourage any viewers to look back at as well. Look at the team sheets from when Mary I won their first Fitzgibbon. I'm going to say it was 17. Um, when they beat you, uh, was it, no, maybe you will beat uh, Mary I actually after extra time. I can't remember, but there was there must have been eight to ten of the current Limerick team or their first few subs playing that day. Uh, Declan Hannon was playing, Garoga Hegarty was wing back for uh, UL, Tom Morrissey was playing. There was a load of them playing. Like, look at the development, look at what that did for their development when they got to county level and got more experience. Yeah, Bill Redden says, uh, Winter Hurling good for young blood, as we'll see with Wexford versus Kilkenny in Wexford Park on Sunday. Keen Byrne and Richie Lawler, Wexford, believe me. Brian I think Nolan... that's Saturday now. I think that game is on Saturday. Uh, we were tagged on Twitter and something there because Bally Hale are playing on Sunday. So it makes sense not to have it on the, on the Sunday. Patrick Hickey says, Brian Lowen said uh, you have to play fringe players as most won't see summer action. So why would they train all year? Which is a very, very true point. You will have that drop off rate. Sean O'Sullivan, no training session will ever push you as hard as a real match. Even A versus B aren't the same. No doubt about that as well. I think we all, anyone who's played any sport really, like it's the competitive action where you sort of see the true self of yourself or, or, or whoever you're up against. Big talk from Vernie on the sideline cuts. It definitely is. He's kind of put himself in his firm favourite here. Obviously, I'm trying to put myself in the long grass. But then again, any of uh, the lads that I've played with over the years know that I'm not really going to deliver on the sideline cuts. I just hope there's long grass to set up the to, up to put the ball on and it's not like a real tight cut pitch. Tight cut pitch probably favour you now. <laughs> Nothing is going to favour me. Uh, Tip beat Wexford in a challenge match yesterday. So I suppose it's easy enough conversation there. The former tip selector, Dara Egan and... Um, and Colin Bonner, easy enough to set that up. Um, interesting looking at the team sheet. So I just, uh, I don't actually have the Wexford one. So if anyone out there does, if they could comment in and let us know if they did see it, who played well. So the tip team was Brian Hogan, Owen Connolly, James Quigley, Craig Morgan, Dylan Quirk, who's in the backs now rather than the forwards last year, Enda Heffernan, Barry Heffernan, Keen Darcy and Jerry Brown midfield, Connor Stakelin, Marine Doody, Keen O'Kelly, Paul Flynn, Dennis Maher and Dylan Walsh. So the name that stands out there is Dennis Maher, Who's in around the age of thirty getting that call it. impress? Yeah, call yeah, it. Talk, call it. Don't don't know if you called it. I definitely called it. You called that it would happen. I called that he be there was a fair chance they'd be back in the panel and was deserved that was deserving of another look after his club farm at Turles. I think you were on the fence over it, but didn't want to upset didn't want to upset anyone too much by saying that maybe he, no he doesn't deserve to be there. <laughs> no, it was never about whether he deserved. I just thought they probably wouldn't. Because, you know, he's been there and maybe an older player. That's what I thought. But I'm not saying he wouldn't have deserved. But it's interesting to see him in there. And I think that doesn't mean he's necessarily on the panel either. This could be a sort of extended, give lads a chance, I'm sure, you know, like they were last week, down a number of players for different reasons. But I, I think it's no harm to have the door absolutely open for everybody and see what can this lad bring that maybe other guys can Hundred percent, yeah. No, we saw a club level as well. I think he's developed, uh, developed into you know a really, really good club hurler. Um, one of the most, um, one of the most influential at club level in Tipperary. Uh, and it's just probably unfortunate that maybe he didn't have that level of experience when he was in there before. Listen, maybe it's too late. Maybe not, and they'll be able to get maybe two years out of my county level. But this is a long time between now and when they play leash on what is the fifth of fifth of February on a Saturday night. And you know, some of the names on that team sheet might might not be on the panel when that time comes around. Owen Whelan says Wexford were sixteen points to one nine up at half time, took off all their players forty five minutes in. So yeah, that obviously does change how you do uh, that result, to be fair, how much can you read into it? Very, very difficult. It is a pre-season challenge match and hard to know how many of those Tipperary players will be starting in the summer. What about uh, Clare and Waterford, though? Do you read too much into, into Clare getting the victory over Waterford in pre-season competition? They definitely had the more experienced team out there. Uh, Rory Hayes played well, David Reedy, Dermot Ryan, Mark Rogers, Shane Meehan and Paddy Donnelly, they were very good. Waterford, uh, Irla Daly, he, he, he showed well. Patrick Kern, Dunford, and Conor Gleeson. I did think it was interesting to see the two Michael Kylies playing for Waterford at different stages here. So one of them started, the other one came on. I'm confusing the clubs now of which started. But I think it would have been a nice little um, way to confuse people in the crowd 
especially uh, obviously the Waterford people would be aware of it, but confuse the Clare people by bringing Michael Kiley on for Michael Kiley to get into their heads. I'd say that's like first and foremost, uh, most in Liam Cahill's mind is to try and you know annoy people or anything like that. I'd imagine so. It's, hey, it's a missed opportunity there from Liam Cahill. <laughs> um, you could you could say maybe looking over the Tipperary job is a missed opportunity too, or maybe it's you know maybe he um maybe he made the right choice. We'll find out later on the year. But as regards this game, um. I think Brian Brian Lowen, you know, probably doesn't need to experiment too much because he's done a lot of that in in the last couple of years and has probably uh, found a couple of more players now. Has a good grasp on what he has available to him. We saw a bit of Mark Rogers last year. We obviously saw a bit of him with uh, with Scarif as well and that beautiful kick goal. He's someone that would be expected to make a bit more of an impact this year. But but Claire, as I said. Um, earlier in the show or another side that I'm excited by uh, this year particularly later in the year um, you know Tony Kelly's to come back Peter Duggan is to come back Shane O'Donnell is to come back and like p- players that have stepped up in recent years Cotton Malone has become a real mainstay of the team uh, Dermot Ryan looks like he could be- become a mainstay at wing back Rory Hayes is you know one of the you know most tigers kind of cornerbacks in the game and is really nailing down a place there. If Paul Flanagan gets a clean run with injuries, you know, he, he looks like he looked at different stages last year, like he was going to go really well for a couple of years. So hopefully he will. Paddy Donnan's another exciting player, Shay Means another exciting player. Um and that's not to mention a lot of the a lot of the big guns he said earlier. So I think they're the, I think they've got a nice little squad. Um uh, and uh, Daryl Owen, whose nephew O'Brien, is in on the squad as well now. So there's another, there's more, there's lots of options there for them. Yeah, searching far and wide for names there. Even for, managed to find his own nephew, to be fair. I know, I'm sure he's a very promising player, just a bit of joking there. But Austin, Austin Gleeson played in the half-forward line. Hadn't scored until the 60th minute, but finished the game with 1-4 from play. To be fair to Shane Meehan, scoring 1-3 one, uh, one in the final quarter as well. He was going to, uh, toe-to-toe with Ozzy, so um, 224 to 122 in that game. I actually have a bit of an, um, a few comments in here. Firstly, from tough cornerback, Shane Meehan is the most talented underage Whoa. prospect in Clare since Tony Kelly, outstanding dual player also, was Munster Minor Footballer of the Year in 2019. Is that true? And actually, who's the most talented underage player in your county that will be coming to, to the senior ranks uh, pretty Big soon? Big talk oh. from tough cornerback. Yeah, which look, what would you expect from a tough cornerback? They want to go out and show up. <laughs> uh, Wexford had Fanning O'Hanlon full back, Liam Ryan centre back, Dio Keith and, Ka- and Carl Dunbar midfield, Liam Oak corner forward. Actually, Bill Redmond has, I'll just quickly run it through the names Fanning, Edwards, O'Hanlon, Debit, Scallon, Ryan, uh, O'Connor, uh, O'Keefe, Dunbar, Hearn, who was very good, I have to say, for Shell Maliers when I was watching him play in the Leinster Club Football Championship. McGuckin, uh, Dwyer, Morris and McGovern and uh, Dunbar. So that was their team there. Aaron Fitz and Shane Meehan will make the team this summer. Aaron Fitz so, is a good player too. Yeah. yeah. A couple of more comments. Limerick had a slow start uh, to the year, lads. Yeah, they sure did. Cahill Lane, Cahill very disappointed with Watford display. Lim- Lohan will bring the best out of the banner, lads, no doubt. Shane Meehan will be a top player, only 19. And Niall Heffernan, hey lad, surprised myself by paying a tenner for the stream of the Limerick match yesterday. I love this time of the year and seeing what the younger fringe players can do. Uh, so, And that's true. Like, There's a lot of games that you'd probably watch that are on streams where otherwise you'd probably just be relying on a newspaper report. So it's nice to have that. And, like, there was a right crowd down in Callan even yesterday um, for Kilkenny Leash. I think there was a right crowd in Ratdowney the week before for Leash and Wexford. Uh Gaelic Ground sold out yesterday, didn't it? Uh, Balnes Law sold out the week before. Um, so there's definitely a big appetite there for it. I think people just want to, uh, you know, when the big gubbins come back, it's a bit different. You want to see some of the young players. Everyone wants, you know, the the Shane Means of this world or the Colin Prendervilles or whoever these exciting young players are. They want to see, can they cut the mustard at this stage of the year? Because chances are that game, you know, the Clare game the other day, that will actually be like more talking about that when Shane Meehan plays championship maybe next year as opposed mm. to this year or when Colin Prenderville potentially plays for Kilkenny in two or three years. But this is when they started out and oh, Cody saw a little something in that game or fans saw a little something in that game. But they're not, not going to be ready straight away. Like, But I think that's the exciting thing. It's about, you know, 
the future prospect that you're not going to see it right away, but you'll see it in a couple of years. And people want to see those players, see what p- different ads have to offer at county level. Yeah, it's going to be a first final for Brian Lowe. And I don't know how motivated he'd be to win a Munster Hurling Cup, but I think it's no harm to ever be able to look at your players lifting a cup and probably even if they're only sort of half smiling and smirking after winning it because, you know, it's not what they really want to win, which is championship silverware. be no harm all the same. But, like, if you're talking about Behan and, and some of the players that that Clare have in that forward line that they're developing in the next, in the last while, it's exciting enough for them. Like, Ryan Taylor is pretty established at this point. Shane O'Donnell, you've already mentioned. Tony Kelly, you know, we can talk about him till the cows come home. Uh, Cahill Malone in midfield. I know sometimes midfield, sometimes half forward. Uh, John Conlon will probably be centre-back uh, again next year. But, look, there's a lot of positives in this Clare team. And he does seem to have everyone pulling into one direction. Mark Keane, going in with the car curlers. Now, it, it developed, the story came out last Thursday when we were live on the show and we weren't entirely sure of the circumstances, but he's played for Cork against UCC in the meantime. And he's been centre back for Bally Gibbon in their Munster club run as they won that title there. But in a 117 to 115 win over UCC, he played in the half forward line. He scored a couple of points. And Kieran Kingston said afterwards, we've had him in now for three sessions and already he's a popular figure in the camp. He brings a new dimension and has a bit of work to do in his hurling, but it's early days yet for him. He go back to his club now for their All Ireland semi final clash on Sunday week. As much as anything, being able to put in someone who's that big of a pig physically, I mean that in a, in a good way, as I'm sure you know. I mean that that's exactly what Cork need. Yeah, definitely. Um, look, if they're going to be playing him in the half forward line as well, big, strong, athletic. I don't know if is he much of a ball winner, but that's definitely probably something that they need as well. Um. It's funny enough, they probably don't need a player that's unbelievably good on the ball in the half hour line. They need a player that's actually going to get the ball. Do you know what I mean? That's actually going to win the ball and potentially uh, pass it off for others. If he's brilliant on the ball, that's probably a, a plus on it. Have to say, haven't seen, I've seen very, very little of him, of him hurling. I uh, just saw, saw a goal he got. I think it was in a county semi final for Bally Giblin when he was in attack. Interesting mm. that they've obviously. Um, he hadn't played much with Bally Giblin, so the easy thing to do was put him in the forward line and hope he'd do damage. He's obviously had trained quite a bit around Christmas and after Christmas, and they're just like, we we have to put this side centre back and see can he totally dominate a game. And he did, um, and he did. So it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, I, that that would be Conor Heaney's remark there would be my one question mark. Conor says Mark Keane hasn't got the hurling lads. Now that's a big statement. Um, and I'm not saying that 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 is true, but I just I'd have to see a bit more of him, probably have to see him in a league game maybe in six weeks six to eight weeks and see kind of how he uh how he measures up against like you know it's all grand saying it'd be great to have him like would he be able to mark Rowan a matter in a monster championship match do you know what i mean that's the that's going to be the acid test yeah uh, absolutely true it's i suppose more you think the potential could be there but being in the afl for a while that's definitely going to take away from your hurling. It'll take a little while. Like if you're talking about a hundred mile an hour in the Semple Field sod, FBD Semple sod in the middle of the summer. Go away, place. will you? Stop peddling yeah. that FBD, FBD crack here now. Yeah, and he like he is playing junior down in Cork. You know that that was the question being asked there. So it is a world away from it. Like he's not twenty four, twenty five though. That's the only thing they, yeah. they've caught. He's they've caught him just in time, or he has stayed just in time. I would say as well. Yeah, Tony Barrett says Kieran Joyce, Castle Martyr, good addition to the Cork setup. I think Middleton's Tommy O'Connell. I think he looks like a really good player, also. Uh, Connor McGrath, Mark Keane, Oshin Mullen, Stephen McCunber, Connor Glass, all back in the GA. Great to see. And that's a point we're actually going to transition on to now. Like Oshin Mullen staying with Mayo. This is a huge story. And like I did tweet about those, those particular names that were just mentioned in the comment there from Connor McGrath. But AFL clubs have taken one hell of a beating because of the amount of players that are um, either returning to Ireland or staying. I think uh, Donica Boyle, your, your, your workmate there at the Indo, he tweeted that there's only, I think, 11 Irish players out in the AFL at the moment. I think for the most part, we'd love if there were none, if you were being selfish. But um, it's it's nice to see so many coming back and being able to give to their county again. The way you were teeing it up there was like, Collingwood, Carlton, you guys have taken one hell of a beat. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is, it's great to see them all coming back. Um, like, Ockenbar is some addition for Kerry. Uh, Keane would be an addition for Cork in, e- in either code, you'd imagine. Mullen staying on with Mayo is, is huge. Like, he's just such, like, he's, he's your you know, prototype modern day football defender. Like has... He could be end up footballer of the year. He's already been a young footballer of the year twice, but like he's so class, he could easily be 
Football of the Year. Oh, easily. Yeah. There's, not, there's, there's nothing he can't do. He has the kind of miserable streak in him as well, which, which is great. He's brilliant on the ball. Um, we've seen him go forward, obviously. He scores, we score a point in the 2020 All-Ireland Final from the full back line. Um, yeah, he has it all. And I'd imagine... I don't know, there's just something about him that kind of, there's a confidence that radiates off him and maybe radiates on to other people as well. And like, Damon, like you have to remember, he got young footballer the year last year despite missing the All-Ireland semi-final as well. Like that was, because that's how good, but that's how good he was when he was on the pitch. And you could say maybe um, that it wasn't the biggest competition for, you know, for the award. But to win that back-to-back, last player to have done that, I think was Killian O'Connor. And we know how much of a kind of a legendary figure he is in Mayo football as well. Uh, I think Owen Kelly did it in Hurling as well. Um, And Owen Cody obviously did it this year too. But like the world is his oyster, I would say, going forward. Um, what was it? what was it? The world is my lobster, isn't that the thing that uh, Jason McAteer I think said in an interview once? Maybe the wrong guy. It might have been the world is my lobster. Um, but a good comment there from Sean O'Sullivan. If you could just jump back a little bit about Marquine, look what a few years of soccer did for Desi Hutchinson. Losing a lot to AFL for a few years might do no harm. I suppose that's the exciting part of it. If you were to think that his hurling will get up to that level physically, he's such a monster, and you'd imagine his level of conditioning is unreal. Like look at what how Colin O'Reardon looked when he came back last winter and played for Tipperary, the way he was horsing through Cork lads that day. I mean, that would probably be the dream scenario for Kieran Kingston with Mark Keane. 100%. On Desi Hutchinson as well, he hadn't played a competitive hurling game in six years, comes back then and, like, you know, look at him now. As I said, I think he's the potential to be one of the best forwards in the country. Um, and uh, I think it's probably an NFL-type saying or an American saying, but there's a massive upside with Mark Keane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the sure is. Actually, did you see uh, Geelong? No, actually, it wasn't Geelong who lo- who will no longer have Mullen. It was the AFL them tweet- tweeted that uh, what's his name, Oshin Mullen, has backflipped on his decision. Backflipped, no less. I'd say he probably could backflip. To be honest he- with you, there's very little he can't do. And there's very few players that if you describe him, well, yeah, he's got a ponytail, he's got uh, pink boots, and he he looks like he has the white ankle socks under over the the main socks and you'd think in what sort but this lad is like pure steel and a rolls royce for footballer i mean wear all the flash you like you're able to back it up yeah he's a real fan favorite as well like they like there is a bit of a buzz there's not many defenders that create a buzz when they get on the ball mm. or when they get in a block or a hand in or anything like that. But he definitely does. Lee Keegan would probably be one of the only other ones and he's going to be uh, in that back line with him. I'd imagine um, no matter what way James Horn would have painted it, he would have been sick at the prospect of losing him, as would other lads just losing him from the squad. They've got back at it. Um, they've been training away and now all of a sudden he's coming back into the squad. Just a huge boost. I think it will just radiate confidence all over the squad. It's a, you know, it's a massive, massive lift. Like a lot of, like a lot of people were, uh, as they do, writing Mayo off on the back of the All Ireland final and then losing Mullen. It's like, ah, oh, that's it. That's the final kind of death knell. They're gone for a couple of years now, and all of a sudden, like, sure, the optimists will be out again, and they probably should be. Yeah. So Killian O'Connor will be back next year, and uh, Oshin Mullen. And I, I, you mentioned Lee Keegan there. I really hope he's able to do all those barnstorming runs for another couple of years. Like he's turned 32 there in October. And you just, I just hope he can kind of stay at that level. Patrick Mullen laughing away at Mayo. Mullen staying for silver uh, medals. Heartbreak Hotel open soon again for Mayo. Conor McGraw makes a good point about Meath. Like, and I think this needs to be viewed through the context of how well Meath pushed Dublin last year. I think it finished up. They lost by maybe six points, but... They kept them sco- kept Dublin scoreless for long periods in the second half. Had it very had him very close heading into injury time, and then just couldn't get the ball back off Dublin. But he says Mead football are dying for Connor Nash and Keen McBride to come home from the AFL. Whether they do or not is another thing. But those are lads that can just cover the ground, and the more lads you have that can do that, just makes a massive difference. Especially well, how look- football has changed, Shane, as well. Like it is like. Like, look at Conor McKenna. Like, look, he, it's obviously, he's obviously a special player anyway. But look at the ground that he was able to cover at different stages in games last year and be on the end of a move that, you know, just a lot of players just wouldn't be able to be on the end of it after, you know, going the length of the field. So that's the sort of athleticism that guys will bring back from the AFL as well. And it fits in perfect with how modern football is played. Yeah, the All Ireland Club semi final draw uh, is, has now been completed. Kilmacud Croaks are going to meet Park Pierce's. I mean, those two teams were already secured in the semi final, and Kilku of Down will now meet St. Finbars of Cork. 
So I watched both games yesterday, saying Finbar's beat Austin Stacks 2-9 to 110. And it was pretty dramatic. I mean, when you think about it, saying Finbar's had a goal on the board after it could have been no more than like 15 seconds. Killian Myers Murray put it into the back of the net after a nice little like a ball had gone into the area. Nice little flick on from Brian Hayes, who a lot of people would have seen playing for the Cork under 20s there in the last year or so. He was brilliant. He scored three points. Stephen Sherlock scored four. Three of those were from freeze. But Brian Hayes kind of really stood out for me. I thought he was excellent. Sam Ryan did a brilliant job of spoiling Kieran Donaghy. Now, Sam Ryan is not a big player at all. And I think I believe he was saying afterwards about doing it for his brother, who's been uh, in hospital recently. But for a lad, he's like, he couldn't be too much more than five foot nine. But he did brilliantly to spring up and spoil Kieran Donaghy. Similar to Mike twice. Casey and Johnny Glynn in the 18 final. Yeah, 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 very much so. I mean, it, it definitely wasn't done his day there, no doubt. Uh, that, that's a bitter pill to swallow for Austin Stacks. I thought Sean Quilter was very good, and he's the, the left footer. I, I believe he was left footer often with these carry forwards. It can be hard to tell, but he was very impressive in the forward line, scored a nice goal towards the end. And you know what? It got into extra time, and there was just a point in it. You know, St. Finbars had gone, I think they were probably 2-8 to 110 ahead at that stage. And you're thinking a kick out here, there's still probably a minute and a half of injury time to go. If Stacks can win this, there might be a score in it. But who wins a free up at the other end? Only Michael Shields. Now he yeah. come on and help set up that goal for I think it was Owen Dennehy towards the end of the game. I think I think it was Owen Dennehy. End of Dennehy, yeah. It was at end of Dennehy, sorry, yeah. Uh he set up a goal with a nice little solo run through and just fed the ball in for Dennehy to finish. But then and I th- I believe some people in Stacks wouldn't have been happy. Like, it was a bit of a foot challenge, and I suppose it was considered dangerous by the referee, but the free was given, it was thrown over the bar, and that was kind of it. But um, also, I must mention, John Kearns with a brilliant save at one stage. Uh, and, and, like, that's the sort of difference. It's such a, a tight game there, but brilliant stuff for St. Finbar's. Probably going to be another level again, though, against Kilku. The way, like... Would you look at this as good preparation for Kilku to beat Derry Gonley Harps 3-10 three, three to 3 points? Or would you be thinking, oh, we'd have rather a stiffer challenge there? I don't know. I think I've said it to you before um, about, I'd say, the same with Ballygunner and Lockmore. It was a matter of just getting the result. Kilku against the Glen was a matter of just getting the result. And then all of a sudden, whoa, you know, it's open, relatively expansive football at different different stages yesterday. Um, yeah, I, I, I think they've had a really competitive game in their, you know, penultimate game. So I don't think they need to have had a, a really competitive Ulster final. Um, just, I think Mickey Moran, has Mickey Moran won five of the last seven Ulster titles that I see somewhere? Three with Schlock Neil, two with Kilku. Like, Fairness, like Kilku couldn't get over the line before he, before he went there, and like it's just one of these lads that you just would love to be on the training pitch just to see what happens and just to see the conversations that are happening with players and how he's instilling belief in them. But his record is his record is second to none. Um, you'd have to say, I like to me, Kilku were favourites for the All Ireland at this stage. Um, and even I think before the, even they played the Glen, they were up nearly there for me. Uh, one little aside: the, the Finbar's jersey is an absolute peach. By the way, it's absolute. It's, do you know what it reminds me of? Is the commemorative Cork jersey that came out the the blue one that came out a couple of years ago with, with the, the yeah oh it's, you know, it's beautiful it's very very nice I saw I saw a fella on Twitter tagging the bars this morning looking to know where he could get one and he's from I think he's from Westmead <laughs> so they've got plenty of fans in that regard but they again they um it was probably never going to be pretty the Munster final um and neither side probably play real flashy football where they're going to be where it's going to be like two fifteen two fourteen or anything like that but it's just massive for the bars to just to get over the line. A good bit of pressure off for them now, I'd say too. Um, and they they take they try and take a good shot at Kilku, but Kilku are just so experienced at this level. And I still I think they're I think they're men on a mission. I have to say after pushing Carafin so close and probably probably letting Carafin off the hook just before COVID hit. And I'd say they're absolutely doing everything they possibly can to make up for that. Yeah, I agree with you on the Bar's jersey and the fact they've only got a harp there instead of a Navefield Bar rather than having a sponsor. I threw it out on Twitter. What other clubs have no sponsor? And uh, Aaron McCarthy replied to me with a picture of the Newcastle West jersey. So they're kind of black up here, white here, and they've got no sponsor. I believe Mullinyakta don't have a sponsor. 
um, up until Friends of Mullinachta or something like that, I think. Or yeah. uh, Karja, it could be Karja Mullinachta or Karja, something like that. Yeah, get your comments in and let us know. Tipperary played without a sponsor last week because their their deal hadn't been their sponsor deal hadn't been sorted yet. Um, so let us know who else doesn't play without a sponsor. By the way, Limerick. Top, yeah, yeah, Limerick, obviously. Yeah, yeah, the best. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Silly me. Um, so I, just to reflect once more on the club power rankings we had there several weeks back. We kill McCord, like there's an awful. <laughs> we haven't done great there, have you we? You were justified. I didn't necessarily agree on the bars, but you were justified having them as high as he did. Yeah. So this was Fintan O'Toole of the forty-two who joined us for this, and I was. I, was I think it was Jason Byrne early. actually. Oh, was it Jason Byrne? Yeah. Oh, I've been on to Fintan as well, saying that we got a few things wrong here. Maybe that one was Jason. Yeah, Byrne. he's. I'm sure he's trying to absolve himself from all blame. <laughs> uh, lads, going off topic a bit. But sometime soon, would you think of doing a best out of 15 uh, football and hurling teams of all time in our lifetime? I'm around the same age as you, so maybe 80s up, what do you think? Well, I'm only about 24, so... <laughs> <laughs> you can double it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd be, I'd be well, well up for that. So this is the best 15 that we've seen in our lifetime, is it? I'd be well up for that now. I think that's what he's going with. Um, yeah, that's something we can definitely do in the, in the near future. So just, continue- just put about five hours aside. Stop! It'd be an absolute nightmare. Can you like you know when we pick the All Star teams live and the amount of comments come in and we're obviously not happy with each other and it's you know a horse by committee. Uh, but just to talk a little bit more about Kilku, that game against Derry Gonley, it was just when you like three years ago it had been a very tight game, one eight to nine points, so there was only a score in it. But this was one way of traffic the whole way through the game. Paul Devlin got some brilliant scores either side of half time. He hit two beauties with his left foot. Daryl Brannigan scored a brilliant goal in the first half. There was some pretty sure it was a kick out that was turned over from the Harps and it was lovely interplay Connor Laverty I think gave the last pass and Brannigan did two dummy solos before putting it into the net the a player who can do those dummy solos and have the composure to do it at the right time makes some difference then uh, Michal Rooney he scored a goal and Sheelan Johnson just to wrap it up at the end buried it into the into the bottom of the net brilliant uh, just a couple of scores three scores for for Derry Gonley Ryan Jones with two and Connell Jones with a free. So the, going into the semi-finals now, the question, and again, as I said, I was chatting to Fintan O'Toole at 42 earlier, and he was mentioning Rory O'Carroll is probably the only player left with an All-Ireland club title from when um, when Crokes won it probably, is it 14 or 15 years ago at this stage, 2007 or 2008? I think 2008. And Mark Vaughan, I've seen him him uh, doing the warm-ups with them and talked out, so I presume he's he's part of that too. With very few, other than Michael Shields with Cork, there's not too many players there with all Ireland titles. No, definitely not. Um, and that's kind of we spoke about from an early juncture. Once Cara Finn, uh, were knocked out, you know, that was you know, and obviously other teams that have been around there, Vinnies have won all Ireland's recently, and uh, Bally Bowden, obviously, too. They weren't going to be like it was going to be the door was going to be open for you know someone to step into the breach, but a lot of them were going to be inexperienced, and it's exactly what you say there. There isn't exact, exactly much All Ireland's ex, uh, experience recent. Kilku were obviously in the final, but didn't get didn't get over the line. I don't know if you saw that picture. The Kilku player uh, escapes me now, but it's the guy that, that wears the the black the black leggings. Oh, um, is it Eamon Brannigan? Could be. I, mean, uh, I think that Eamon Brannigan is the man that used to play for. Um, Used to man who's played football for Galway, but I think it, I think the right second name is right. But he's actually wearing uh, one boot, I think, is an Adidas Kaiser, and the other is a Nike Tempo. Uh, so he's actually wearing like odd boots, which I have not seen. I can't remember the last time I've seen that, to be honest with you. Um, but it's just mad, like, and maybe it's because, um, maybe it's because he's wearing the, the tights that you just wouldn't notice as much because your eyes are drawn to the tights but that was a that was a mad one i haven't i can't remember the last time we've seen that or if i've ever seen it i've seen lads wearing odd socks but not odd boots i think he got man of the match too if you're talking about number seven um i think that's him brannigan yeah i think it's seven yeah i think it's seven yeah but that's yeah, but... um he could be setting a trend there you never know so get the comments in and let us know who you think is going to win the all ireland club football title from there Later on in the week, we're going to be talking about Bally Gunner against um, Schlocknail and St. Thomas's against Bally Hale. Looking forward to those games. But the Munster Intermediate Football Final was on at the weekend. Nigel, like for a finish, they fairly paced it. Carfin of Clare, 6.15 to 
Yeah, and it was tight. You know, it was very tight at half time. It was two four to seven. They were up at half time, and then they hit three eight to a point in the third quarter, and the game was over. And I believe it was a lot of tactical switches that they made. Dermot O'Connor moved to midfield to partner Jack Barry. Like that, that's an inter county midfield at at intermediate club level in Munster. And uh, Stefan Ockenbar moved back to number three, which like he played. He's played a bit midfield for. For Kerry, um, already in their first game against Limerick, but number three, you know, at a full back man in the square would have been where he would have been most at home at minor. Um, and I think he played a bit of under twenty there as well. I think he got, I think he got man of the match from full back in a Munster under twenty final when Jack O'Connor was manager, to the best of my knowledge. But him moving back to number three, that was that was a big uh, that made a big difference uh, in that kind of burst in the third quarter. Jack Sheehan, who's only a teenager, fired two two. And they were totally dominant thereafter. I think Jamie Malone kicked four points for uh, for Cara Finn, but they were a beaten docket at that stage. And uh, Nigel powered on. And then if you look at, you know, the Munster Junior final, I'm not even going to try and pronounce <laughs> pronounce the name. You might say it there. I think, and get the comments in and let us know if this, if this is right. Guinaguilla. Yeah, that's it's just there's I can't a lot get of silent letters in there. It's yeah, and there's a V in there the that language. must be silent as well. So, but they they took care of Ballina, uh, 14, 418 to one six. So again, you have Kerry champions dominant at Munster Junior level and dominant at intermediate level as well. So uh, they were on top form. I think they led two nine to one four at the break. Sean O'Sullivan hit two two. Um, I think Stephen O'Brien who got back from suspension to play. He kicked one two for Ballina, uh, one of which was a free, but they were they were beating all ends up, beating all over the pitch. Mikey Breen played centre forward or started centre forward anyway, but Ballina were yeah chasing shadows for most of the game and ended up what were they what were they beating? They were beating twenty one points in the wind up. So and Willie Connors obviously missing with that double ankle fracture, which is very unfortunate for him. But with the best will in the world, I don't think you could have said he would have had enough of an impact to turn around that sort of a deficit. But uh, yeah, again, Kerry very dominant at uh, intermediate and junior level, provincial level in Munster. P well seventy four. Don't the Bears have a down footballer with them at the moment? Jack Connor McCrickard, uh, tough corner back. Ninth team in Kerry versus number seventeen in Clare. Ten of the Nagale team played senior county championship in Kerry this year. Not a fair playing field. In fairness, yeah, there there is a bit of an issue there, and we we talked about it in the in the hurling as well. Should Kilmoyley jump into the senior championship? Should Nays jump into the senior Leinster championship? It's not, it's not an easy one. No, no, definitely not. Um, it's probably something I'd say, I think we've definitely gotten onto it in Offaly as well by bringing the senior football to eight teams um, and even bringing, when senior hurling was at eight, it's gone to 10 now. When it was at eight, you know, our ninth team was going into the Leinster Intermediate Championship, the senior B winners. And, you know, they had a great chance of getting the finals because they were coming up against, you know, counties lower or teams lower ranked in other counties. So Kerry are definitely hitting the jackpot in that regard. Uh, you'd have to say Tipperary are have very little chance of winning any of those junior or intermediate titles at provincial level, just by basis of, as you said, what number were mine, Temple Tui? What ranking were they when they played at Kilmiley, who were the best team in Kerry? Oh, it was, you know? it was like 33. There you go, like, you know, it's so I think um depends what way you look at. I think that you, by by cutting down the amount of teams in your championship, you have a more competitive championship and your your teams going into your county championship winning teams going into the provincial championships are going to be more competitive as well. So I think that makes more sense. And I'd be surprised if more counties um don't start just tightening it up a bit and making sure that the standard going into the province is much higher. It's not a good look for a county, you see, as no. well, like, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, definitely not. And also the clubs would enjoy it too. I mean, if things are restructured, they might at first feel a little bit sore about going down a level. But if they actually go on a journey and win an All-Ireland Club title, they'd be delighted. James S., he tries to give me the phonetic breakdown of how to pronounce that Kerry champion team. Gen, hard G like good. Uh, Eve like Adam and Eve. And Gwilla, another hard G. So, Gen Eve Gwilla? Gen Eve Gwilla, I'm on board with that. I'm I'm on board with the V. I knew the V had to have some meaning in there. Gen Eve Gwilla. Gen Eve okay. Gwilla. It'll need a bit of practice. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Leinster Intermediate Football Final, Trimby, Clara, 115-28. to And Clonda Belogue in the Junior Football Final beat Kilcullen, 5-3-110. to Now, you had predicted disaster for Offaly in both games. Clara lost, obviously. Clan Belogue did get victory there. And... We won't talk about what we were doing on Saturday, but we were a little bit preoccupied on Saturday doing something or other. 
Uh, but I was keeping an, uh, keeping an eye on the Clonbelove score, and there were three goals to one point up on Kilcullen early on. I mean, where would you see a scoreline like that? Yeah, I don't think they kicked their first uh, point until the 40th or 41st minute. Um, it's just mad. Like, and Clonbelove have played lovely, free-flowing football, real attacking football the whole way through the Offaly Championship and the whole way through the, the Leinster campaign. But they had a bit of an attacking malfunction the other day. They had a lot of, a lot of wides, just, you know, Jamie Ging, who'd be a very, very talented player, future Offaly senior prospect, I'd imagine, um, just had a bit of a bit of a bad day in front of the post. But they still managed to win this game. The Kilcullen were chipping away at their lead the whole way through, chipping it back, chipping it back. And then Clumbelo got a bit of a kind of a fortuitous kind of a goal. I think a free that everyone expected to go over the bar. And this happens a lot, doesn't it? Where it just it just he dropped the chart and they weren't ready, and the forward just came in and kind of flicked it, flicked it to the net, which happens. Stacks nearly got a goal like that one that hit the post and came back out. Could have easily yeah. been tipped in. Yeah. Um, it's just there are times in games where players just switch off. Sometimes. Like if, if you don't make it obvious that you're that you're going to drop a ball in or something like that, um, it, it can work the odd time. But uh Keith O'Neill was very good uh again off limited possession for Clan Balog. I think he hit one one. He was marked very, very tightly. His brother Rory was very good as well, even though I think he was carrying an injury into the game. Um Clan Balog will fare well, very well at senior B level in Offaly next year. And they'll fare pretty well in the All Ireland stages too. They were they were poor the other day. Their attack was poor, but their defence, with probably unheralded, was very very good and kept Kilcullen out. And like to win to win a game, scoring five goals and you know conceding eleven scores to the eight that you got, but still winning is is huge. And um, it's just it's a big deal for them. I think no Offaly club had won a Leinster Junior. Um, since the late 90s I think so that's great Clara unfortunately came up a bit short against Trim but as you said they would have been missing uh, Thomas Deaton who would have been one of their, their best forwards but uh, you can't take anything away from Trim there and to be fair I I would have been happy with one provincial title out of out of the two and again along with Rhinus winning the Camogie the Hurlers winning the ring last year and getting promoted the 20s winning the All-Ireland, the footballers getting promoted to Division 2. There's a lot of things happening at different grades and different codes in Offaly, which is great to see. Yeah, Jack Nolte says, Clon Belogue will fare well. Offaly Senior B beat us uh, the first round and continued their form. Hopefully they win it all. St. Faithlocks uh, won the Connacht Intermediate Football title and beaten Nevana 2-14 to 2-12. Bit of a, a turn-up for the books in terms of the scoreline in the All-Ireland uh, club semi-final in ladies football. More Abbey absolutely pasted Dunboyne 6-17 to 5 points 4 goals for Laura Fitzgerald I don't think anyone expected that sort of scoreline no way uh, no way no uh, Dunboyne went through Leinster really pretty comprehensively apart from their, the extra time win against Tinnahili and uh, obviously the Vicky Wall and Emma Duggan and Shelley Amelia um, and I think the two more Mead panellists as well Vicky Wall and Emma Duggan would be widely regarded as two of the best footballers in the country, but they were just totally shut out yesterday, completely. A uh, word on Laura Fitzgerald, she got four goals, she has ten goals in her last three games, and funnily enough, uh, I was chatting to Shane Ronan the other day, they took Darren O'Sullivan away from full forward, so they have her out centre forward, maybe doing less scoring, and they have Laura Fitzgerald inside now, and she scored 10 goals in three games, and I think Kira O'Sullivan is playing kind of a, a freer kind of a role, but, you know, he was, without sounding overconfident, he was waxing lyrical about, he thought they were in a really good position going into the game, and, you know, they definitely delivered on it that's a real statement performance they're going for three All-Irelands in a row with obviously that gap year of last year when the competition wasn't played and they're going to be playing Kilkerran Clownburn in the, the final in a couple of weeks they beat Dunamine 2-8 uh, to 8 points yeah and so just a quick run through some of the inter-county football Dublin beat Longford 16 points to 5 uh, Desi Farrell has used 39 different players over, over three games there so he's obviously looking for, for new people to step up and let's see, um, yeah, the likes of Evan Comfort, Mick Fitzsimons, Johnny Cooper, Dean Rock and Conor Callan, they haven't seen any game time yet. But I suppose, I suppose, I suppose it doesn't really matter to have, to have these, having these established players out there just yet. Offaly beat uh, Loud 15 points to 2-6, Meads off Wexford. I suppose the main reason to dwell on that game is uh, Brian Malone has called time in his inter-county career. Yeah, and a, and a fair innings, 16 seasons with Wexford. Started, uh, I think he made his debut in 2006. Uh, he played in the All-Ireland semi-final in 2008. I think he was teaching in Blackrock Black Rock College at the time. And um, 
they played Tyrone, were beaten by Tyrone, and he said he walked into Blackrock College the next day and not one person in the school, I think, was aware of the fact that he had played in all Ireland final in front of God knows how many in Crow Park the day before. He'd probably only started a couple of days at that stage and, you know, you're not going to be going around, going around giving the big ones saying, oh yeah, I'm playing in Crow Park or like that. And he'd be a quiet enough fella by his nature anyway. But, um, not, like, I know we, we say it regularly, like, he, he would have made, he would have made most teams in the country. He was such a, a solid defender um, even just looking at a picture of him playing for Wexford last year against Dublin like he was in phenomenal shape even for his for his age at 35 174 league and championship appearances for Wexford miles ahead of the next I think the guts of about 60 65 appearances ahead of the next closest to him uh, just crazy longevity and uh I kind of got wind that he wasn't involved. So I just texted him the other day just to kind of confirm it. And he just said, well, Mick, yeah, retired. So it's just like, this is a lad who's, there was no statement from or anything like that. Just a fellow who kind of always did his talking on the pitch. And I suppose he actually won an intermediate All-Ireland with Wexford in 07, I think. Won two senior hurling titles with Chelmaliers. I think he won two football titles with them as well. Just a, a supreme athlete and just like, you know, Matty Ford, Adrian Flynn, all these lads, um, Colm Kyo, all these lads that played with him uh, were just kind of waxing lyrical about him as well and how much of a team player he was. Just sounded like the sort of lad that you'd love to have in any dressing room. Yeah, without question. A couple of other results then. Uh, Leash beat Wicklow 214 to 111. Ross Munley, who made his debut in 2003, was it? He was like so, yeah. Several years even before Brian Malone, who has those 174. Um, uh, appearances he scored three points one of those from a free uh, he had won a tight actually won a Leinster title with Billy Sheen who's now the manager and turns 40 in December that's so, unreal now Shane at club level you'd be doing what you'd be you'd be happy to have a lad still talking out at club level in in his 40th year to be still doing it at county level is just crazy yeah and Galway claimed a 10th Connacht FBD league title they beat Ross Common 118 to 116 came from behind Rob Finnerty scored five points Con Paul Conroy and Shane Walsh chipped in with three points apiece. In the McKenna Cup, the semi-finals are on Tuesday. Armagh, Monaghan and Donegal, Derry, and just a couple of those results. Armagh beat Tyrone 215 to 115, and Donegal beat Antrim 15 points to 1-9. Go to the week time. Oh, actually, comment in here. Since we're on pronunciations, uh, Faitlox is pronounced as Folias. Well, at least I know that for future. It's like Mount Bellew, my law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not lock. It's law. So, go to the week time. For me, for me, I think it's got to be Donald Burke in the hurling with his 18 points against Galway. Um, who's your, who would you be your one for hurling? I'm going to give it to a manager uh, in football. I'm going to give it to Mickey Moore and the man with the Midas touch. Kilcoo okay. were the bridesmaids until he, until he got involved there and uh, they could be all Ireland champions in a, in a month's time. Yeah, I'm 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 half tempted to give it to Oshin Mullen, but I think that'd be unfair <laughs> <laughs> on the boys who got it done out in the field. And I think I'll give it to Brian Hayes of St. Finbars. I thought he was really good. I was half tempted to go with Paul Devlin because of the quality of some of his scores, but I'll just about go with Brian Hayes. Um so that's it for I have show. a nanny go to the week as well. I had oh. one last week also. Laura Fitzgerald scoring four goals and hitting ten goals in three games for uh more nabbies. That's that's some going, it's some strike rate in fairness. That that is fair going indeed. Uh, Kilku were the bridesmaids, says James S. Now they're getting married. Man we'll Martin see. story, boy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. Okay, that's it for the show. We'll be back again on Thursday. If you're uh, if you're a regular, please do subscribe to the channel. Press that button, bottom right hand corner on YouTube. Costs nothing to do it, and it's good for the channel because it recommends it to other people. Uh, Patreon.com forward slash our game if you want to uh, support the channel. You'll get, uh, it's the only place to get the audio podcast, just a fiver a month. That's it from the show. Michael Verney, we'll chat to you again. Cheers, Shane.